Welcome everyone. You're joining us at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library's Virtual Learning Studio in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Kathleen McDonald, Interim Associate Director of Education. The Pritzker Military Museum and Library is celebrating its 20th year with a mission to increase the public's understanding of military history, military affairs, and national security by providing a forum for the study and exploration of our military, past, present, and future, with a specific focus on their stories, sacrifices, and values. With national and global reach, these spaces and events aim to share the stories of those who served, helping citizens everywhere appreciate the relationship between the armed forces and the civilians who, whose freedoms they protect. The Virtual Learning Studio offers monthly webinars designed for teachers to use in the classrooms grades six through 12 and any age beyond with guest speakers from across the country. Be sure to sign up for our emails and go to our website for information on upcoming programs. So I'm very pleased to have with us today, Kimberly Geis. Ms. Geis is a senior curator and director for curatorial affairs at the National World War II Museum, where she's worked since 2008. She specializes in wartime correspondence and the prisoner of war experience in World War II. She's curated several major exhibitions, including Guests of the Third Reich, Americans POWs in Europe. And her presentation today is going to cover the experience of nearly 94,000 Americans who were held as prisoners of war by the Germans during World War II. Ms. Geis will explore aspects of the POW experience in Europe and show examples of the many American POWs and how they coped with their captivity. On behalf of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, it gives me great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Kimberly Geis. Thank you very much for having me today. It's my pleasure. So as Kathleen introed, I'm Kimberly Geis. I am Senior Curator and Director for Curatorial Affairs at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. And our mission here at the National World War II Museum is to tell the story of the American experience in World War II. It's such a giant story that encompasses so many topics within. We tell the stories of 16.5 million Americans who served in uniform during World War II. That includes the 120,000 Americans who were POWs th throughout the war. Um, and then millions more who went through the war in various, in countless other ways. The title of this presentation, Guest of the Third Reich, is taken from an artifact in the museum's collection, an actual POW diary. And we'll look at many examples of these diaries later on in this presentation. Um, one, uh, one of the things that we'll also discuss later is how POWs often hu used humor to keep them going, to keep their spirits up and, and keep, their, um, keep them alive. Um, so guest of the Third Reich is a very sarcastic term that POWs in Europe used for themselves. They were temporary guests. Um, guest of the Third Reich is also the title of an exhibit that I curated at the National World War II Museum a number of years ago on the American POW experience in Europe. And much of what I will cover today was a product of that exhibit. So here you see the actual diary with the term um, the Guest of the Third Reich. Um, and you can see the appropriate ritual was celebrated in a ditch. Um, this was a, a diary of Newton Cole. He became a POW very shortly after D-Day. So we'll see more of his work later on. Since the very first armed conflicts, combatants and civilian populations have been taken prisoner by the enemy and how they've been treated has varied widely from a somewhat tolerable experience to the absolute worst conditions, perhaps even to execution. But even with some legal protections, their situation isn't pleasant, wasn't pleasant. Um, POWs are taken in a time of war. And the definition of a POW is a member of a military service captured by enemy forces. How a captured individual is defined and classified by the enemy is extremely important throughout history 
and it remains an important subject today. With war still ongoing worldwide, a prisoner's status and the treatment of prisoners of war is still very much a relevant conversation. In World War II, there were slightly over 121,000 American POWs. That number includes both the European and Pacific theaters. In Europe, there were 93,941 POWs. The large majority of those POWs made it home alive. Uh, 1,121 died while they were held prisoner by the enemy. In the Pacific, the numbers were very different. The Japanese held far fewer American POWs, 27,465, but a much larger percentage of those POWs died while captured. And so 11,107 American POWs, or roughly 40% of American POWs in the Pacific did not survive the war. Here's a little breakdown of that. These figu figures are alarming. Um, and while captivity in Europe was largely survivable, it was not pleasant. And the circumstances of your capture, the who, what, and where um, dictated your fate. There were instances where American airmen who were captured ended up in concentration camps and other instances where American flyers um, didn't make it into POW camps at all, where they were lynched and murdered either by enemy civilians or by the SS. But these were exceptions to the rule. So first we'll look at who these men were. Who were the guys who became guests of the Third Reich? In Europe, early on in the war, most American prisoners were airmen. Airmen engaged in the bombing campaigns against European industrial centers. They were shot out of the sky or otherwise forced to bail out of their airplanes, um, just like the guys that you see here. Additionally, there were around 4,000 Americans who were taken prisoner after fighting in North Africa in February 1943. But the real numbers in um, ground troops, especially in POWs, um, begin, of course, in June 1944 with D-Day, with the Normandy invasion. And we already saw that excerpt from Newton Cole's diary. He was captured shortly after D-Day. And so that's when um, uh, the Germans began to capture American ground troops, of course. So the largest number of troops Americans captured um, were taken prisoner later in the war with 23,554 Americans. And that's a third of all POWs um, captured in Europe. 23,554 um, were captured during the Battle of the Bulge alone. So that was from mid-December 1944 through late January 1945. That was only five months before the end of the war. So that that was the, the largest number captured at, at that one time. In Europe, the average length of time spent as a POW was one year. And that was because of the large numbers captured toward the end of the war, kind of skewed, skewed that um, average. The average age at capture was 25 and at release 26. So these were relatively young people going into the camps. Here you can see um, the beginning of um, captivity. Um, we had um, the airmen sort of marching into captivity and here we have see uh, an illustration of an interrogation and then also an ID card. So what began here with an interrogation um, and processing of forms ended up here. So the Germans built around 100 POW camps, mainly throughout Germany and Poland. And Americans were typically held with large numbers of other POWs in one of these camps or lagers. There were different types of camps that were numbered. You can see Germany and the 
Third Reich, essentially Germany and, and the territories that they held at the time were divided into zones and camps were numbered according to the military zone that the um, camp was in. POWs in Germany were assigned to one of three types of camps, typically. There were OFLOGs, which were officers' camps, STALOGs, which were the main camps, uh, usually for en enlisted men, and STALOG LUFs. Those were um, camps for airmen. STALOG LUFs were originally run by the Luftwaffe, that's the German Air Force, and the other camps were run by the German Army. But each camp had a commandant, a com commander, who directed a cadre of guards and laborers who directed daily operations within that camp. So here I have some of the terms that were used, POW-related terms. So I've mentioned Stalag, um, Kriegi, and Kriegi is an interesting word. Kriegi is short for Kriegsgefangener, long German word. <clears throat> that means POW. So Kriegi is a shortened version of that, and Americans referred to themselves, or prisoners, not only Americans, but prisoners of the Germans referred to themselves as Kriegis. And then Appell, and I'll, I'll talk about Appell in a little bit. That's, that's what you see um, going on here in this image. Within each camp, the men were usually segregated by nationality. So the Americans were typically housed near to, um, but separate from the British and other allied prisoners. Um, in accommodations, the, the accommodations ranged from um, wooden barracks to concrete cells. So wooden barracks, you see the barracks here in this image, and they had a capacity of anywhere between eight to 40 men. Furnishings were typically minimal. They had, you know, wooden bunks, um, typically a stove, a small stove or a table, um, some shelving, but they were, you know, not, not comfortable conditions by any means. And because the POWs or the Kriegis referred to themselves sar sarcastically as guests, um, their accommodations sometimes they called hotels or inns. Um, but they were a prison camp, barracks in a prison camp. The daily routine differed according to what kind of camp you were in and, and what your role was, what your rank was. Um, so that was the largest factor, I guess, um, the, which determined where you were placed and, and what you did if you became a POW. And this was something that was outlined in the rules um, that dictated treatment of POW uh, of POWs, and that's the Geneva Conventions. And we'll touch on that a little later, but extremely important in terms of POW life. According to those rules, enlisted men were required to serve on work details. And for, for that work, they received largely useless camp currency. So it wasn't a... Um, a great job. Um, officers were not required to work. Um, they could volunteer to do this, but they weren't required to do so. For most POWs in Europe, one of the main um, the hallmarks of, of life, everyday life, was appell. So that's our, our third word on the POW term list here. Appell is roll call. And appell happened twice a day, usually, um, and prisoners were made to be to stand and be counted. So this usually occurred in the morning and the evening and bracketed one day in the camp, either at 8 a.m., 7 p.m., something like that. The rest of the day um, was filled with either long, empty hours um, that seemed impossible to fill or long days of working, depending on whether you were officer or an enlisted man on a work detail. So after roll call, those not working could largely schedule their time as desired. 
here you see, this is where um, prisoners spent a lot of time. This is a, an image of a barracks, a typical POW barracks. You see, they do actually have a lot of furniture in this picture, but bunks, stools, you know, very crude furniture, and many of it was handmade by the POWs. So a lot of time was spent here um, with your fellow POWs. Also, outdoor activities were allowed. If you looked at that previous picture, it did not look like a fantastic outdoor set to, in which you wanted to spend a lot of time. You know, it could often be very cold, very rainy, muddy, but outdoor activities were allowed as was movement within the designated boundaries inside the camp. So after evening, um, after evening appell and sunset, you were typically confined to your barracks and there was a nighttime lights out that was strictly enforced. So this, this became your, um, your main space, your bedroom, your living room, your kitchen, everything. And kitchen. <laughs> Here we are. So here is a, an image of a typical stove with some POW cook standing around it. So how did Kriegis occupy their free time? This is one way. Um, food and thinking about food occupied much of a POW's time overall because they didn't have uh, food and that, and that was they didn't have enough food at any rate. Um, and so it, they spent a tremendous amount of time um, thinking about food, preparing what little food they had. They usually began their day with some kind of substitute coffee or tea, maybe hot water combined with any scraps left over from the night before or something that they had squirreled away. This would be followed up by a lunch at noon and then an evening meal at five. So people had a pretty, um, even though the free there was some free time, um, there was a, a, a schedule, a routine. Now, in terms of food, the Germans did provide food for the American POWs. The intended daily ration provided by the Germans was somewhere around 1,500 calories a day. It consisted of uh, a dark, not very delicious bread, um, and then also potatoes, cabbage, sometimes maybe even a little, the tiniest bit of sausage. Now, another important source of food um, for American POWs, for allied POWs in Europe, was. Um, provided by the Red Cross. So here you see this giant tower of crates and with two men working on top, um, preparing some of those. These, um, this is a Red Cross warehouse in um, Geneva, Switzerland. And the Red Cross aid packages that were received by um, POWs in Europe was essential. Many credit the Red Cross with saving their lives because they did receive additional nourishment from the Red Cross. So the American Red Cross, the Red Cross overall, was permitted to distribute um, more than 27 million parcels to U.S. and allied prisoners of war during World War II. These packages were assembled in a mass effort by more than 13,000 volunteers in distribution centers around the U.S. And POWs were intended to receive one Red Cross parcel per week. That rarely happened, very rarely. Um, I'll show you an example. So these are the crates, and within these crates are, pack are the parcels themselves. Here is an example of a food package which then had different kinds of packages inside. Um, but the packages contained mainly non-perishable foods like um, crackers or biscuits, raisins, coffee, powdered milk, canned beef and fish, um, along with other things like soap um, and um, cigarettes tissue paper, toilet paper. Um, so these were received by American POW representatives in the camps 
and then collected, usually collected by those representatives for fair and orderly um, disbursement. So it wasn't a free for all when these packages came. It was they were distributed in an orderly way by American um, representatives, by by leaders in the camp. They also POWs also received special Christmas parcels and um, that contained holiday treats. And then but then as war conditions worsened, so. Um, when German supply lines were disrupted and the weather was bad and any if anything went wrong, these packages were the first thing to kind of disappear. And um, so the POWs that were captured, I talked about large numbers of POWs who were captured late in the war during the Battle of the Bulge. They received very little aid because that aid flow, the flow of aid into the POW camps was cut off. So um, the so it varied how the amount of additional food POWs received from the Red Cross varied throughout time. But there's no doubt that the additional, when they did receive them, it was really crucial um, to help sustain both body and soul. And um, uh, none of these, all of the the things that we're talking about with the Red Cross um, in Europe, this was not present in the Pacific. So this was unique to European theater POWs. So in addition to um, receiving this aid from the Red Cross, POWs, um, Kriegis were allowed to keep vegetable gardens and some seeds were provided, vegetable seeds were provided in these aid packages and provided by the YMCA. So they also provided um, material for POWs. And then supplemental food was pooled and um, cooked communally in the barracks like, like we saw earlier. POWs talked about food almost constantly, and you'll see some examples of that later. They reminisced at about favorite restaurants at home, back home. They kept list of where they'd like to eat when they when they were free men. They compiled cookbooks with recipes made from ingredients from the Red Cross aid packages. Um, and one of my favorite recipes I'll share with you later. Um, it's a recipe for bread pudding, which is very New Orleans, of course, um, but it contains the instructions, eat if eatable, if not eat anyway. And that's that sums it up about the POW experience and food. So passing the hours, days, and weeks not knowing when one would be freed was for many a really, really difficult experience. It was maddening. And to pass the time, POWs would engage in just about any activity. Uh, housekeeping, you would think, you know, that's that's not a fun activity. But no, it does take a lot of time. So washing and mending what little clothes you have, um, exercise, walking around or actual sport, learning, reading, studying, creating things, carving, um, sketching, making furniture, as you saw in the, the barracks picture. Um, Sketching and writing, very important activities. Group recreation, cards, checkers, um, gambling of any kind, <laughs> um, theater. And that's, you see an image of a theater production here. Um, some costumes were provided. These are all uh, POWs. These are actually, um, this was a, a British piece here. So they're likely British POWs here performing a theater piece. But there were also some really funny activities that you hear of, like um, any way that people could think to occupy some time, counting the barbs on barbed wire, racing mice, herding imaginary sheep. So any, you know, fighting the clock, any activity was um, was important. So many of these activities, um, like the theater performance you just saw, um, and then this piece here, many of these activities were facilitated by the YMCA, who provided recreational, religious, and educational supplies for POWs. 
Almost every sport imaginable was played in European theater POW camps with equipment provided by the YMCA. Mini golf, ping pong, football, boxing, baseball, track. And so here is a program for a track meet that took place in a POW camp in Oflak 64 in Schuben, Poland. And on September 16th, 1944. So you can see all of the events they had here and actually a recording of who won and, and how people placed. So there were nine events. It, this was a, a big uh, undertaking. It wasn't only observed by the POWs, the German guards also found this uh, track meet very entertaining and theater pieces. Um, one of the interesting thing about things about sports in POWs, football, um, American football, <laughs> um, became uh, was discouraged at some point after too many injuries. So, you know, there, there was a limit uh, even to what kinds of sports they could play, though. There were camp baseball leagues. Um, Stalag 7A had a couple of teams. The Bomber Aces would play the Luft Gangsters. Um, so there were, you know, big, big sporting events that took place um, throughout Europe. But not everybody was into sports. Some Kriegs founded colleges in the camps and set up educational, strict educational course plans. Law and German classes were the most popular offerings. Um, and But you could study almost anything in a POW camp, speech, finance, music, art, calculus. Courses were taught by fellow POWs who often had to teach some teaching or professional experience. And some POWs were even able to take exams to receive college credit after the war for courses that they completed while in the camps. So the camp colleges were supported by libraries. And the bulk of these books were furnished by the YMCA, but you could also um, receive book parcels from home, from your family. They could send you books one a month. Um, and everything was allowed except for escape or adventure stories. Those were discouraged, not, not allowed into the camp. But one of the largest libraries had over 15,000 volumes. So these were big libraries. Here you see um, an image of Kriegis in a library here. So Kriegi, a Kriegis life was completely devoid of privacy, and rumors ran rampant. They tried to glean information wherever they could from newly arriving POWs. You know, what, what's going on? What's the situation in the war? From letters from home, by eavesdropping on guards, that was another big activity, as well as from contraband radio receivers used to secretly monitor Allied broadcasts. So we do actually have one of those small little tiny radios in the collection. To share these bits of information, some camps founded POW newspapers. And here you see an example of one of those, Kriegi Chronicle. This is a hand-drawn one. Some are actually printed, but this is a great one here. Most had typical columns. Um, Gridiron Groans is a, a sports column, so just like a regular newspaper. Um, many camps also had bands. So instruments were typically provided by the YMCA, um, but occasionally POWs made their own instruments using whatever supplies they could dig up in the camp. Some people, some camps had orchestras, jazz bands, glee clubs, everything you can think of. Um, they also had art classes, art exhibitions. Here you can see a, a beautiful piece of art. Um, made in one of the camps. These things all sound and look incredibly unbelievable in a POW camp, right? Why would the enemy allow these things to take place? And one thing that all of these events and activities did was to keep the prisoners busy, to keep them active, to keep them off of the guards' backs, and keep them from trying to escape. So here you see some of the barbed wire surrounding a camp and a guard tower, uh, machine gun, 
searchlights, all of the things that kept POWs in the camps. And the attitudes and actions of camp guards had a direct effect on the daily life of POWs. The guards were referred to, here we'll learn a new term, um, POW term, the guards were referred to as goons. And you can see here this, this image at the bottom right says goon box. So a goon box was the guard tower. Um, some guards man sat in the goon box and manned spotlights and, and machine guns while in their watchtowers. Others, mainly English-speaking guards, nicknamed, were nicknamed weasels. Um, they were assigned to monitor POW activity and listen in on barracks conversations. Typically, the guards were not considered sadistic, um, and sometimes you could even barter or trade with guards. Some of the things that you got from the aid packages, they might want something. If you could trade with a guard, that could greatly increase your quality of life. Another type of guard was called a ferret, and these ferrets were supposed to sniff out escape attempts. So they often went under the barracks, raised wooden barracks. Um, they often would go underneath the barracks. Those were ferrets. So despite all of these dangers and the machine guns and the barbed wire that you see here, thousands of Allied POWs tried to escape from their German captors. Of the Americans who attempted escape, only 737 managed to make it from a camp back to American lines. So the odds were approximately 28 to 1. It's very unlikely. But escape was seen as both a duty and a diversion. So it was something to do. Just sitting around thinking up how you would escape was um, a way to occupy your time. And occupying the captors in pursuit efforts even, you know, was considered a victory even if you didn't actually escape. So the main methods of escape were tunneling, slipping away while you were on work to tail, or cutting through or going over barbed wire. But German camps were built to thwart these kinds of escape. They had the raised barracks, they had double barbed wire, guard towers with searchlights and machine guns. So those that was all engineered to keep POWs within the camp. Prisoners who were unable to stand up to the isolation and mental strain of life in German camps were said to have become wire happy, barbed wire happy, or they had barbed wire fever. Um, again, you had very little privacy and very close contact with a lot of other individuals of all stripes. Just think of being confined in one of those rooms with people from all over of, of all different types. So many would um, become close friends and people relied on their buddies and the contacts they made in the camp. But others were polar opposites and were very difficult roommates. Some POWs coped with their captivity by sleeping and they were um, called sack happy. They hit the sack all the time, sack happy individuals. It was a coping mechanism. Um, and for many POWs, just dreaming about the future, what life would be like after, and planning your life as a free man outside the wire in a peaceful world sustained them. So with that, I think I will pause and give Kathleen a chance to weigh in for some questions. At the beginning of your program, you talked about the um, point of capture and how they were interrogated um, at that juncture. Um, were they interrogated after that point or was it just that one event? So it was typically at that one moment. So um, in of, of capture, there were actually camps, interrogation camps, um, where people were held right um, after they were captured, if they were lucky, um, and sometimes even put in solitary confinement to rattle them or scare them a little bit, and then they were interrogated. And according to the Geneva Convention, you were only supposed to say your, your name, um, rank, serial number, um, and so you, you were not obligated to give the enemy any 
some, any information about, you know, what you were doing in the war, what your unit was, all of that. But that was done in these specific camps, usually right at after the point of capture. And then you were filtered to a more permanent camp where you were. Um, and if they had tried to escape, um, were there repercussions within the camp, camp wide, or just to those individuals? Um, what would happen to those folks after they were captured from trying to escape? So it depends. Um, you know, there was one very, um, the most famous and, and uh, escape attempt occurred at Stalaglyph Three. Um, that was uh, known as the Great Escape. Um, so um, there were very, very serious repercussions. The men who were apprehended were actually murdered, were killed by their German captors. Um, so um, it was not a pleasant situation if, um, if individuals tried to escape. But that that's the extreme example. And that's a that's a different lecture. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of information on um, the website of the National World War II Museum about POW life, about escape. We also have a podcast um, reviewing the film The Great Escape, which is um, a fictionalized um, treatment of of that account. But yes. Um, another question, how were POWs with H on their dog tags treated? That also, I have another lecture on that topic, but um, and an article on, on the, uh, the, the, our website, but it varied from camp to camp. So prisoners with H on their dog tags. So um, uh, uh, um, the American army, um, put notif uh, recognized religion. So American military recognized religion on your dog tags. So your dog tags were stamped with either C for Catholic, P for Protestant, or H if you were Jewish. That was H for Hebrew. And that was done during World War II. And um, it was very risky when you think about it to have that um, target kind of on your dog tag, symbolizing you, setting you apart, identifying you as Jewish um, to an enemy that um, was trying to murder um, the all of the Jews in Europe. Um, so that was very a very risky activity. Um, and many um, American, Jewish airmen, for instance, or many American Jewish soldiers, airmen, were um, tempted to throw away their dog tags if they were captured because they were afraid that they would be singled out and um, killed um, or at least, um, you know, suffer um, extreme consequences. That wasn't usually the case. So there were um, a few instances um, of of where Jewish soldiers, Jewish POWs, were singled out, were separated and segregated from other POWs um, in Stalaglift One. That happened towards the end of the war, um, and it was very, very frightening for those men. Um, but the the American leader in the camp was able to. Um, to, I guess, hold off on any action by the enemy. And so, so largely American Jewish POWs were, um, were treated like the other, um, the, the Catholic and the Protestant and, and anyone else agnostic POWs, but it was a tremendous psychological um, strain and, and fear. Um, and very real fear, I think, depending on who, what camp you were in, who, um, who the guards were, who your other, your fellow POWs were even sometimes. Um, and that's, that's a really tragic story is if you have a Jewish American POW who is in a, the very same room, a barracks, a, a room with an anti-Semitic um, 
fellow POW, American POW. So there are so many stories there, <laughs> but I, I do have an article um, on that very subject. So it, you can read more. So this question may tie into that as well. And this will be the last question that we take in this um, break and we'll do another Q and A at the end of the session. Um, but we have a write in. My father was a POW at Stamilager 12A. And how is Stamilager different from uh, Stalag? So Stalag is Stamilager. So, so there were a lot of uh, abbrevi abbreviations. So um, Stalag is Stamilager. Um, so sh it's a shortening of it, just like Oflag is Ofatsir Lager. Stalag is Stamlager. So um, I'd be happy to learn more about your father's experience. But but yeah, so there were a lot of the the German military is and the American military actually all about abbreviations, right? Abbreviations and acronyms. Great. Um, so Kim, why don't you dive into some of the more personal stories that you talked about for this second segment? Sure. All right. So I, I talked a, a bit about this. Why was it so different in Europe, right, than, than the Pacific? Um, and what rights did POWs have? This is one um, pamphlet that was often given to um, people who were going into uh, combat, either, you know, airmen usually um, received this this pamphlet if they were flying. If you should be captured, these are your rights. And this outlined some of the basics of the Geneva Conventions, what you what happens to you when you're captured. Um, although it was not always strictly adhered to in um, Europe, there were a, additional measures to maintain living prisoners in the European theater. So we saw that with the Red Cross aid, YMCA um, supplies were allowed in, and um, the Red Cross was responsible. Well, here you see some of the additional um, uh, rights afforded by the Geneva Convention. Man of confidence means that you were allowed, prisoners were allowed to elect a leader among them who would be a mediator with the camp commandant. That's That was very important. That was very important with Jewish American POWs in, in um, Stala Luft One. So labor, it specified who was, um, who had to work and how, um, and then mail. Prisoners were allowed um, to receive mail, to send mail, and that was very, very important. The Red Cross was responsible for food, for mail, and for medical supplies. And the YMCA was responsible for religious supplies, educational supplies, and for recreational supplies. And this is one additional piece that um, I'll, we'll do a deep dive into this uh, subject right now. Um, I, we talked about how... Um, one of the main sources of frustration and isolation was time, fighting the clock, not knowing when you were going to be freed and having all of these hours to, to basically be in your head, right? So the YMCA attempted to, pro to provide a tiny bit of relief and recreation to servicemen who were praying for this release Beginning in 1943, the War Prisoners' Aid of the YMCA supplied these blank journals entitled A Wartime Log for inclusion in the Red Cross aid packages. It's a, probably about 20, over 20,000 of these were printed. It's not exactly known how many made it into prisoners' hands and how many survived to this day. That's an unknown number. Um, some they were occasionally censored by um, by guards or maybe uh, lost along the way. Um, but here is the cover of one of these diaries. They came with um, a cover letter that explained their use. You can see a remembrance from home. Um, but there was an instruction that let these books be a visible link between yourself and the folks at home. We're thinking of you. 
So paper and writing implements were in very short supply in the camps, along with all other supplies in general. Um, so these were a way for prisoners to record their daily events, their personal thoughts, poetry, artwork. They served as sketchbooks, as journals, autograph books, scrapbooks, cookbooks, songbooks, and photo albums. So these were prized and bartered and traded. Not everybody um, had received one, so they weren't in every package. And around 20,000 were printed. There were 90,000, 93,000 POWs in Europe. So, you know, not everybody wanted them, probably. Not everyone um, wanted to sketch out their frustrations or their hopes, but um, they are some, they are amazing treasures from the time. And a lot of what I know about the POW experience comes from these sources. So I'll, I'm giving you this little look inside the museum's archives. This is one piece from B-17 gunner Sam Moore Jr. He was part of the crew of a plane called Paper Doll. They were shot down and held in Stalagluft 4. So you can see that um, he says, you know, he's going to put this collection of cartoons, poems, pictures, and prose intended to portray the lighter side, if any, of prison camp life in Germany. If in the far future it brings happy remembrances of buddies and chuckles to my friends and myself, then its purpose will have been well served. So that sums up, you know, the, the these um, books, really. There are central themes in a lot of POW diaries. Flight and aircraft, a lot of the men who were in these camps were shot down. So they that moment is sometimes referred to as their chop when they're in their parachute and they're um, shot out, shot down. Or there I was, there I was minding my own business when I was shot out of the sky by, the, by um, a German fighter. They also contain memorials because um, many of the men in the um, moment when they're shot down um, many did not survive. And so many of these albums contain memorials. Food. Food, of course, is ever present um, again. Um, poems, songs, and list. The Red Cross. We saw a couple of examples of that already. And then roll calls. These are all topics that are listed in books. Now I'll get to show you some, some great artwork. So um, the Caterpillar Club is um, a, a club for people whose lives were sh were saved by a parachute. Um, they're, you know, the caterpillar and silkworm and the parachute silk um, that became the the icon for for that. Um, so you see different variations on this, sort of the origin, how they ended up in a POW camp, right? These are all from the collection of the National World War II Museum. Aircraft. Some of these illustrations are very elaborate, very good, and very disturbing. Again, a variation. These albums came with um, colored pencils. And so um, you can see variations. You know, some of them are, are in, in color and beautifully illustrated. Some um, of the albums would contain illustrations by various individuals, people who were naturally artists, and they would pass these albums around and and so you might have one journal with drawings from different men. Here is a memorial to um, a crew member who was killed in action. And another. So unfortunately, and a very strong theme throughout these diaries. And this as well. This one is from a paratrooper who was um, held in Stalag 7A. And then the Red Cross. So the, this is, you can see an illustration of, of the box that we saw earlier, the package and the contents. So spam, I'm, I forgot to mention spam as a uh, something that would be included in, in the boxes, but spam, of course, chocolate, cheese, milk, soap, 
And very similar, this is, you know, a Christmas dinner menu from Stalagluft one. Um, there is a Christmas pudding. They had a Christmas put pudding. They had wine, I think. <laughs> um, sometimes people would manage to make their own alcohol in the camp, which is fun. And they also made their own stoves. So this is a good little example of a POW cooking with a handmade stove. And you can see his little Red Cross box next to him. Here they are dividing the Red Cross parcel. And again, dividing it. So you see, you see two very similar illustrations from two very different artists. Um, one is dessert for eight. They're trying to do the math to figure out how to, to divide up that uh, bread, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, and here they're chop it, saw it, butter it, eat it if you can. Again, more contents of the Red Cross package. These items, these journals tell us a lot about POW life, just in terms of what kinds of things they were receiving, how much of it, um, all of this. Here, you can see top left, there's the recipe for bread pudding. Eat if eatable, if not eat anyway. We have a lot of these POW recipes. We have not made any of them. Now, we talked about some of these libraries and how many books they had in their collections. Um, this is, many people kept list of books that they read in the camp. This guy read a lot. We also have poems, beautiful illustrations of morning roll call and the chaos of a barracks room. The journals include sketches of POW life. So this is the North and the, the South camp of Salaglyph three. Beautiful illustrations. One of the main themes is um, also your roommate. So these books functioned as autograph books and remembrances of the people that were in the camp with you. So here you see examples of list and list and list of names. Again, addresses, you want to reach out to these people when you're back home. All different types of people. They also function as dictionaries for us to learn about POW life. So you see some of the terms that we learned today. Appel, lapel, that's a French take on that. Goons. Um, so these ferrets. A ferret is a stalking menace. And time, calendars, um, calendar pages passing, life at home. Some of the albums contain pictures, so photographs that were sent to POWs were pasted into them. They were able to receive mail, photos, books, as I mentioned. And then dreaming of um, a future life. So that was kind of a, a whirlwind at the end there, but it's been my pleasure to share some of these images from the museum's collection and share these stories with you. It's important to remember that many of these POWs were, were quite young, maybe um, not much older than some of you. And it's important to think about the situation that they found themselves in and the ways that they coped with being held prisoner by the enemy. So how would you pass the time or cope with um, a similar situation, make your life a little bit better if you found yourself in the same situation? I, I think of that myself too. So thank you. Thank you, Kim, so much. Um, I love seeing all these primary source uh, materials that um, we don't often have access to, but it really brings the story to life. Um, feel free, audience, to submit questions into the Q&A. Uh, we'll take a few more questions. Um, we talked a little bit before about um, being designated as Hebrew on your dog tags, but could you tell us a little bit more about were there practicing um, openly uh, the Judaica? You talked about the YMCA 
uh, sending religious materials, was that dangerous? Um, there are examples of, you know, services being held, religious services being held in the camps. Um, there were, um, you know, there, it was, um, it was not usually, uh, there were no reprisals for that, that kind of, um, for religious practice in the camp, even, even Jewish. Uh, but but normally you were not if if um, Jewish POWs were often isolated, um, so they did, might not have had an opportunity to hold a religious service because there were not a lot of Jews in their barracks or in their um, compound. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it was um, maybe not a, a very frequent public occurrence. Yeah. Um, and. Were there any images of, of some of the work that they were doing in the work details? Um, there are a few images, actually, of that kind of work. So that's one of the things with these diaries is that many of them were kept by officers who were not required to work. And so um, there are some that were kept by men who had to go on work detail, but they had less time to sit and draw and write and read. And so there are fewer, um, we have, I think three out of, you know, 25 diaries that were kept by, by individuals who had to go work on work detail. And the work they performed varied. Sometimes they worked on farms. Sometimes they worked um, even in German cities, clearing rubble or that kind of thing. But um, but the the work could vary. Typically, it was of, of an agricultural nature. Great. Well, that's about all the time that we have today. On behalf of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library and our guest speaker, Kimberly Geis from the National World War II Museum, I would like to thank you for participating in today's webinar. We hope that you enjoyed today's program and you will subscribe to our YouTube channel and provide feedback. Our next Visual Learning Studio webinar is Double Victory, World War II and the Civil Rights Movement, which will be held on February 9th at 1 p.m. And in the meantime, if you will plan a visit to the exhibit Life Behind the Wire, Prisoners of War on display through April of 2023 at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library in Chicago. And be sure to also check out the website from the National World War II Museum where you can learn more from Kimberly's uh, various articles and other webinars. Thank you so much.